We'll be able to kick off now. So thank you everyone uh, for coming to this. This is the fifth uh, LSA CPD we're running now. Um, today we have uh, Dennis Austin of DAB Design and he's going to be um, talking about collaborating between practices and practices, how large practices and small practices can work together and you know have a symbiotic relationship for mutual benefit. Uh, the CPD will touch on the ins and outs of uh, such partnership, what to account for, how to clarify scope division, and how to manage workflow and maintain a common focus throughout the delivery. For those of you who knew or the first CPD we've done with the LSA, the aim of this talk is essentially, or these talks is essentially to encourage discussion more so than to have someone lecturing. So we, we give the question time at the end equal billing towards the time for the talk. So there's 30 minutes for a talk and then there's 30 minutes for a discussion. Uh, what you can do is put questions into the chat function and I can read them out. That seems to be going pretty well so far. Um, however, if you do feel confident and you wanna be the first one to break the ice, please feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, that's also fine. Um, I'll encourage you to do so. But until then, um, I'm gonna hand over to Dennis. He's gonna take it away. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks a lot, Jason. Um, we, as a practice, have been on both ends of the collaboration. Uh, in past life in, in large office and currently DAB Design, a five-year-old practice, we've been collaborating uh, in the role of a small office. So when the LSA uh, mentioned that they wanted to put together some CPD courses, we thought it would be a good idea to talk about the process. You know, long before there, the glossy photos and, and the, the great stories of how a smooth this collaboration between large and small practices uh, have occurred, there's the process, there's the, the ins and outs and who does what and the organization. So we thought today would be, just as Jason said, more of a discussion with a lot of questions about how do firms work and, and what is the ethos. So why are we collaborating? Um, historically, there, there have been a lot of situations where clients were mandating. Uh, they wanted one firm to supplement their team with some expertise. I think that has changed greatly in the last uh, six to 10 years, where there's an open desire and, and, and since COVID, there is a, a, a driving need to provide platforms where large offices can practice with small offices, a group of small offices can collaborate. You know, put it under the, the, the title of social value, put it under you know, sharing, knowledge sharing. It, its purpose is to make sure that as a profession, we're able to understand how different people work, how we can collectively work to solve these issues uh, that we have in society. So sometimes what I hopefully can, can touch on this talk is, is, as I said, the both sides. So as a small practice who is looking to collaborate, um, you have an enormous amount to offer. Um, the days are long gone where it was the Goliath who told David uh, where and what and how uh, their scope will be. Uh, it, it's an incredibly exciting period today for emerging firms to be working with larger firms on rich, complex projects. Often, the, the client has, has, has mandated that. So a lot of RFPs today, we're all seeing um, that the nature of the project mandates that there's a large structure. The, the multiple tasks uh, required by the architect are suggesting that it's not done by one office anymore. That is a host of offices who are working collaboratively. So in the ins and outs, you know, why we're collaborating is very much about sharing talent. It's about exposing individuals within our profession to different aspects of projects. And when I speak of collaborations between large and small, I want to be clear, it's not a project where firm practice X is done, REBA stage one, two, and three, and hands over. This isn't a linear. So many large projects and, and, and medium-sized projects are blur that, that boundary between REBA stages, between deliverables, and what's becoming more and more the desire of the client, the large clients, the institutions, the, the, the public amenities, is that they want a team who can do this. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a team that have been doing this together for years and years and years. So when you collaborate, you know, how do you pick your partner? 
uh, as a small firm, as I said, you have a lot to offer. Um, who do you want to um, go through the next five, seven, 10, 12 years together? You know, what are, what are their values? What's important to that office? So for a larger office, it's understanding what it is that you are looking for. Many times there are um, there's sort of a, a talent uh, limit within a large office. Yes, they can do every phase of projects and, they, and they've got the resource and they've got the ability to team up a, a, a large uh, resource pool for a project. But the collaboration when it works well is when they pull in various firms for specific expertise. And that expertise is very much about experience and it's about their passion. It could be a building type. It could be a geographical. You may collaborate with a small office uh, because you're doing a project in another country and you're entering into a whole different culture, language. Uh, that, that, that test of a project where you, you are forced to, to enter into another culture is an amazingly fulfilling process when we go through it, uh, uh, through the project. So picking your partner, you're looking for someone for a long-term relationship. You know, this is this is you know you're looking for like-minded people, as I said, and you're looking to understand what is it that they're why have they contacted you? Are, are they looking to fill a seat in a, a, a token reservation? Is this just I need an underrepresented firm? I, I need a, a non-traditional office. Therefore, you know, you're perfect. No, you, you really need to know what is the driver behind this uh, implicit. Uh, collaboration. For a small project that allows you to, to be a lot more visible than, than in the past. Uh, large offices can seek you out based upon not only what you've built, but again, you know, the, the catch 22 of a small office is that perhaps you haven't had haven't built all that much. So they're looking at your websites, they're looking at, you know, your, your blogs, your news, you know, they're looking at the publications that you're working on. And what that is giving the large office is sort of a window into the soul of who you are. But that works in two directions. Do not, just because you get the phone call or an email from a large office saying, oh, this is fantastic, we're gonna work with the Coca-Cola of architecture. <laughs> understand what it is that you will be doing and understand why they are contacting you. Collaborating uh, in a group for a duration of a project, um, for many years relies on fantastic communication. Every office you know, boasts, oh, we are great communicators. We, we, can, you know, we communicate well with our clients, we communicate well with our consultants. Quite often, they don't really communicate very well with their own staff. When a large office is, is seeking a small office, what is happening is there's the potential of a project. There's an RFP and Immediately, the large office says, this is great. Let's, let's look at our team and the, the team of consultants that they will go to and the team of, of as technical assistants. It's always that moment they think, okay, who are we gonna collaborate with? We need a, an architect. <laughs> is it a production architect, a delivery architect? Is it an architect who's going to be providing community engagement? It's the communication from day one, how they contact you, what it is that they are interested uh, in, in collaborating with you. That communication then gets transferred to the client very on, early on. And organograms are documents or graphics that clients read. <laughs> they read them very well. As architects, we, Every firm has sort of the blank model organogram illustrator and it's just plug in the names for that right moment. That's not true. Every large scale competition, RFP, joint venture, the client is no fool. They want to know how you, your group, has really read the documents, has understood what it is we're asking of you. So the organogram is the first chance to really communicate to the client that ability to group together. And it should be seamless. Um, 
And it should be an organogram that grows with the project. It should be an organogram that, that really reflects the communication process. What's important about organograms also is that it's the opportunity at an early stage for you, the collaborating architects, to draw out from the client the weaknesses of the project. Your organogram from day one should be clear of who you're communicating with, or who is the chain of command, and it should pull out to the client, we will not be engaging with this for the following reasons. Or if you do want us to engage with these consultants or these other practices, we're more than happy to. However, it's beyond our scope. So what it does at an early stage is it begins to provide clarity. Now, what's in a title? Uh, there's a lot in a title on a project structure that small firm and that large firm put together, the, providing the seamless voice for the architectural vision for the delivery of the project. Don't forget our people, as I said, who are reading these documents. They know very well what it is that you're trying to say. So when you begin to organize your team and you begin to show that there is a development between the architectural phases of the project and the consultancy, Make sure that you, as a small firm, you have your place at the table. From day one, make sure that you are, you are heard, you are listening. There's so much that happens that you really do need to be part of. Now, what's fascinating is this last almost 11 months of, of practicing under COVID. It is flipping everything upside down. And to, to some extent, we're collaborating within our own office on a regular basis. You know, our staff are working remotely. I'm sure everyone out there, their staffs are working remotely. If you're a student, you were working remotely from your, from your professors and, and, and from, from your other student, uh, student bodies. What is happening now is that we have this way of communicating that, that assures us that we can and cannot have access to the, the proper information. The place at the table basically for a small practice is to make sure that when there are discussions about the design that you're part of it. When the large practice is beginning to suggest modifications to that correspond perhaps beautifully with the client's demand for, for phasing, that you're aware of it. The idea that you know, you have as much to give as the large office cannot be really underestimated. Now, the, the last thing with an organogram is that it needs to grow. It needs to show the progress of a project. It needs to show that the architectural team has thought this through. It, it's, it is a window to our thought process. It is also a way, as I said, of establishing with the client this is the beginning of our resourcing. We'll give you more detail in the future. This is where we see our expertise, and this is what we are not doing. Within a collaboration, probably the most important thing is to make sure that from day one, you've defined a path to resolving your, your disputes. There will be disputes. They will be design-oriented disputes about the direction of the project. There will be fee, there will be scope, there will be every imaginable uh, dispute between you. What is the most important rule is clearly, as I think we all know, never in front of the client. Make sure that there's a structure that you have worked out from, from early on to ensure what are the red lights that are saying, hold on, our teams are not getting along, or we're doing duplicate work, or we actually were working to two different programs. We thought we had an agreement. Understand, and what happens is it begins to put the right pressure on the management of the team. A large practice will have people who have been managing projects and probably large projects for quite some time. A smaller firm may or may not have that experience. Don't worry about that. What's important as I said, is that you have equal footing, you have the right to be in the room, and you are providing as important service as a large firm. You have absolute right to, to be in that uh, process of defining uh, dispute resolution. 
workflow of a project is 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 really where you test the relationship of, of two collaborating offices. It's the brain trust, uh, who decides what. Um, it often is an incredibly dry series of documents. Um, don't worry about that. Um, dry documents are ultimately the design manager's tool to communicate to the client. But most importantly, the client will have people on their side who are reading those documents, who are examining them, and are going through with fine tooth, tooth comb. The dryness of the document is the end product. What's critical work with workflow in a large collaboration is to just graphically define who is doing what, how are we working? Are we working in, in, in a single office? Um, there are many examples of, uh, call it what you want, integrated design team, concurrent engineering, professional framework agreements, where, where there is pre-COVID, an office full of 75 people from various firms and they're all working together. Who is deciding that workflow and how that workflow gets communicated is not an imposition from above. It's by understanding the team. It's by understanding how the team works. It's by understanding how the team has actually comprehended the, the scope and the requirements from the, from the client. From these doodles and, and communications between practices, you will be able to to, to ultimately provide those documents that are design manager, organograms, charts, flows, and, and deliverables will communicate to the client. The resourcing, which follows, you know, you, 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 define, you define what you're doing. Well, first of all, you, you sort of, you tell the client what it is you've been asked. You remind them of what the client has asked you. A lot of clients think, oh, the team got it. You know, we get on, we start negotiating the contract. That's not the case whatsoever. You have to almost return back to the client and say, this is what is being asked of, of us. This is the workflow. This is the program. This is the time frame. This is the resourcing that will equate to our fees, to our deliverables, and ultimately, the most important thing, which is building this series of, of, of buildings. What that means is that it requires a, a real earnest you know, view of who is doing what. Often, there is this knee-jerk reaction, oh, let's just put names on, on charts, let's get bums on seats. It is an absolute recipe for a disaster. What that does is ultimately, it is just a ticking time bomb. It will catch up with you. When you resource your project, when you begin to assign individual names to the tasks, make sure that you have corresponding skill sets. And this is where our profession is really quite interesting. This is the phase of the project where we begin to understand the, individual, the effects to individuals within the project between the firms. And this beginning of a, of a positive cross-pollination between practices. One of the deliverables you'll, you'll have uh, as a, a collaborative effort to the client is, is, is a program. How long will it take? Well, how long will it take really is a result of, as I said, understanding what's being asked of you, resourcing it, diagramming, sketching, doodling, how we'll do it, where will we work together, Again, COVID world, world, we are all working independently and many aspects of it is working smoothly. The whole idea of collaboration post COVID is going to change. The people who have had experience in collaborations will need to adapt. The whole process of how firms interact will be much more fluid. However, what will not change is that it is always based upon the understanding of the tasks and being able to sensibly schedule out. How long do I need? How long, how long do I need for my team? How long do I need to coordinate within my team? How long do I need to present to the client? How much time are we giving the client to react? How much time do we need to 
react to their comments. Quite often, design programs, people jump right into MS Works and just within 45 minutes have this whole thing. And you, you look at it and say, crikey, wow, these dates all line up. This is fantastic. When you really begin to, to examine it, there are bullet holes in it. There are huge gaps of, of recognizable time. And really, part of that recognizable time is the impact to the team. Practices work at different pace, different paces, one from the other. People work at different pace. There's an, on large collaborative projects, there are the, the, the working environment of understanding how people work takes probably 30% of the time. The, the, the rest of the 70% is actually implementing the work. So maintaining that order of deliverables and, and workflow and hierarchy, who has the ultimate design voice? Um, who has the, the, the direct line to the structural engineer? What you need to do, small or large, is to agree on that quite early on. And it does not mean that the small firm cannot do that. The small practice has every right depending on their background. So what happens is it's this beginning of an understanding of, of how people work. Once we, we start talking about how people work, we need to look at the ability to adapt and measure. So the, the measuring aspect is, is quite interesting. How people cross coordinate and how we define roles and responsibilities are important between firms. Those roles and responsibilities are the guidelines to make sure that you don't have two practices essentially doing duplicate work. Uh, two practices working, as I said before, working at different rhythms. Oh, I thought we had another six weeks for that. No, don't you understand? 70% draft is due, due next week. Oh, we'll, we'll have time after that. No, but 70% time will need time for review, comments, and implementation. That cross flow and, and, and the definition of who does what between practices is critical. And when it gets, when it works well, you begin to see this, you know, the blue and the red becoming purple. You see this sort of rising of talents on one side, being able to meet a challenge on another. And it's an incredibly exciting process. What is super critical to all that is defining the scope division. Um, that could be done geographically. It could be done phase-wise. It could be done by building type. Each project has a clue to what that pro appropriate answer is. Do not worry that from day one, you need to have that scope division immediately defined. You need to understand what is being asked of you. You are going to do the public realm. Great. I think I got what that means. When it gets to the public realm, you know, what is the direct interface to the building, to the facade? What is it with the agencies? So that scope division between practices becomes an incredibly important. The product of that scope division becomes a document, a legal document between practices, which is, a, which is really important. Pitfalls of working together in small or large are many. They range from egos. Uh, they range from uh, unlike-minded firms. Gee, we really thought they were going to be different. Oh, gee, we really thought they were going to be a lot more proactive here. We, we didn't think they were going to be so, so corporate. Oh, we, we thought they'd be a lot more agile. All of that can be monitored from the beginning it can be something that is kind of uh, sussed out by understanding what it is you're being asked for, understanding between the teams how they see your, your team, your sub team. And, and this idea that, well, actually, three of my people should be working on your team there, and I should take two of you because of their expertise level. So, how do you crisscross and cross pollinate, as I say? I think something like that becomes the, one of the most key factors to preventing these large scale pitfalls. When it works well, it's incredibly exciting. Um, the 
cross collaboration between large small uh, practices gives you the ability to uh, do it again. It gives you the ability to, to for a small practice to say, it's amazing. Wow. We work with company X that we never thought we'd work. Actually, we can do that again with, with the other larger practices. We now have the beginning of a skill set. And that might be, as I say, building type derived. It might be geographical. It might be cultural. But more importantly, you as a small firm, you have the ability to go in and integrate and to be able to be empathetic to the needs of the projects, the clients' goals and requests and, 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 and directions. Where it gets super exciting is, is when everything is blurred. And it's exactly what freaks out the client's design manager. Risk and risk assessment and risk reduction is what they live on. Blurred lines freaks them out. They don't know what to do. But when it works well, even the client will begin to say, listen, I, I don't know how this is working, but it's working really well. When you get that cross, cross collaboration and it is no longer about the corporate identity or our, our office culture. It's about how three people are getting along, how 13 people are getting along, how 70 people are, are all living the same passion for the project. And that is something that it, it, it is achieving together. It's this idea that as a profession, Again, we, you know, we look to the end product and we look at the glossy and we say, oh man, oh, the project's amazing, oh, the stunning, oh gee, I wish I worked on that. What was it like to work on? Some of these projects are hell and it is an enormous pull and demand from the individual. But the individual is what will deliver this project. How we guide the individuals, how we become open to understanding each individual's um, professional development, their professional curiosity, their personal development, their, their ability to, to take on a task that you never thought they would have. It's, it becomes a, a truly glorious uh, unveiling of, of, of an architect in front of you. It becomes something that is, you know, truly um, this, 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 this path to, to success. So the, the idea of why we wanted to put to, together the CPD and sort of put it under the guise of large firm, small firm, doesn't really matter what size firm. As a profession, it's about the individual. It's about how we take from student through part two, part three, through young uh, uh, package manager to, to project architect, all, all these titles, they help us with the large projects. They help us with, with small projects, quite honestly. They help us with everything. But more importantly, they're about how each individual can fulfill what it is they thought this profession could give to them. That's something that we don't address often enough in office environment. And Jason, that's why we, we kind of want to thank you for, for giving us this platform um, to really discuss, uh, to go from organic gram to it's about personal development. For me, that's, that's hyper important in our profession and what we do as architects and, and hopefully in my own practice. It's about understanding how everyone is on this path that is completely independent from everyone else. How you got into this profession is completely independent of, and, and there are as many uh, road paths to getting into the profession as there are applicants to all the universities in the UK or, or to study architecture. It's how, when we practice our craft, how can we do it in an environment where we share, we understand, we're there for the excitement. I mean, there is no greater thrill than to work on something and to see these passions of, 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 of architects, consultants, crane operators, suppliers of material, you know, get excited about it. So really 
um, I think this is where I'll wrap up. And I really, hopefully, if this is a success, we'll have a flood of questions. But Jason, I think this is where um, we thank you for, for giving us the, the platform. Well, thank you. And thank you, Den uh, Dennis. It's been a pleasure to have you. Um, well, I can see the questions are starting to come in now. Um, Thomas is raising your hand. Go on, Thomas. Um, thanks, Jason. Thanks, Dennis. That was that was really interesting. Um, I think this uh, sort of just to give you context. I, my practice is now thirteen people. We've been going for about six years, and certainly we're we're getting to a point where we are starting to collaborate with bigger offices, and it's something that we we really want to do. Um, one of the uh, part of the process, obviously, is that that strange dating game to almost describe it as at the beginning of yeah. that process, whether it's for competitions or tenders or whatever it might be. Um, you've obviously been through this a lot. Uh, what, what advice or thoughts would you have on, on that particular process in terms of how can, how can the small practice make that, make that work really well? I think um, there are two potential pieces. You are either, as, as a 13 person office on the receiving end of someone saying, hey, you know, you've been brought to the, to the surface. <laughs> uh, we're curious about you. We, we saw Project XYZ, um, or you know, we've seen that you've done. I, I think what you need to do immediately is uh, abandon all, uh, uh, all pretensions that, um, that the large firm actually may really need your help. They do. They, there are... There have been several situations where the smaller firm is bringing so much more to the larger firm. And so I think for you, I would A, remain confident, you know, certainly show excitement. And it's always great when someone rings up and says, you know, you know, would you guys consider going in on, on? is it a real project for me that that becomes a real thing? Um, that be, allows you to classify it and in priority, priority, because a small office like you know, it, you're agile. You um, you can, I imagine, uh, if things come together quickly, you you can all of a sudden have you know a team of four, maybe three full time, one you know, part time, dedicated towards this. And it might be the beginning, the lead part of a project where the large practice can't. <laughs> they can't assemble a team as quickly as we think. Or if they're assembling a team incredibly quickly, it's a team that I can assure you will not see the end of the project. A large practice can very easily switch and match, uh, switch and, and, and it, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the great uh, shell game. You know, a small practice from day one, you have individuals that have qualities that you can you can demonstrate and a large firm i think you'll be surprised to say wow crikey you know look at those resources look at their cvs this is exactly what we need so i would say remain confident and and begin to look at classify is it real is it a long term you know is this an investment thing which is great they're all you know you always we need a lot of irons in the fire so I think it's uh, begin to, to prioritize and do not underestimate your importance. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, I can see a question from Peter Tracy and um, they ask, um, it's about professional indemnity insurance implications, particularly for smaller practices and uh, can that be off-putting? Uh, Peter asks. Uh, yes, it can be. Um, you, uh, you know, and it's, it's a state of this profession that is atrocious. Um, so scenario one, um, large firms contacting you as a small firm say, you know, we're, we're um, it, it may be a call from another country. You know, th there may be a, a Portuguese practice. who said, you know, we've been invited to this practice and uh, to this competition in the UK, or we have a client in the UK. We are going to be doing this project. Would you go into the competition with us or would you partner with us? Um, once you receive the documents and you understand the, the level of insurance, you've got two choices. You've got uh, a, a sort of a plead. <laughs> can I be under that? Because there is no way that I can, you know, I changed my insurance today to, to 20 million and I am paying those, those premiums for the next 15 years. 
I, it's not a tap that I can turn on and off. So yes, it can be off-putting. I think you need to measure it in what will this project give you? Will, will that insurance issue be a non-starter? Typically, it won't be. You need to work it out. And it might just be that it becomes embedded into your fee as well. Um, but it's that it's not just the insurance, it's the inherent liability. So when you do that scope division document between, the, between practices and there is you know, lead respondent support, you know, understand what boxes you're being ticked. And all these things which are incredibly managerial, a small firm, you do need to be careful. You do need to read all of these documents. So insurance is a complete minefield today and it's, it's abhorrent for our, our profession. Um, measured against what you think you can get out of this project. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we've got another question from Alan, who asks, um, while I'm sure each has its own idiosyncrasies with regards to large firms or small firms, which is the more challenging to work in and which is the most enjoyable to work in? Thank you for the benefit of your experience. The most challenging... Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. You know. From my years in working in a large practice, collaborating with small firms and working on large projects, it um, it's, it's thrilling. You're 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 representing a team of ninety people. You're up in front of the client uh, three times a month. So there's this demand. There's this pull. You're orchestra. You're you're, you're a conductor of of all of this. Um, but it pulls you further and further away from the actual work and the design. And it, it turns you into a manager. Now, again, this profession is bizarre. We, you know, <laughs> you know I, I'm from the States and, and it used to be a, in many, many offices, it used to be a great sign of you advancing in your career where would they, they would take away your drawing table and give you <laughs> basically what was the equivalent of a secretary's desk years ago. You know, and it was, wow, look, he made it. He's no longer drawing, he's, he's managing. And so I think the, my experience in a large firm is, is that you're pulled further and further away from perhaps what really excites you about architecture, which is the problem solving, the figuring out, the working directly with your colleague. The small firm, um, the, the challenge is, uh, is keeping toe to toe, um, to keeping a relationship where you know, the, where you don't get that phone call from your collaborating large practice who said, oh, listen, you know, we've changed it all. You know, we'll, we'll send you the sketches, you know, everything, we've abandoned everything. It's, it's all going to be like this. And you think, oh, hold on. <laughs> Why weren't we part of that discussion? You know, so the small, you, you're up against the sort of the, the, the Goliath. Uh, you're trying to stay toe to toe. But I, I think what's a whole lot more rewarding, quite honestly, is, is the small. Um, we're practicing quite differently now, everyone in architecture. It is no longer, uh, you know, we know everything about, uh, about rail transport, therefore, you know, we're the kings. That, that, you know, it's bollocks. Anyone who says we know everything about anything, quite honestly, I don't think you want to collaborate with them. You want to collaborate with a firm who says, yeah, we've, we've done a few rail stations and, you know, we, they're, they're, they're difficult, they're fun, but, you know, we're still learning, you know, we're, and we want you to be part of that. We want you to come in because we know, you know, you've got this, um, you've done these great projects where you've got this interface between the public sector, uh, between public environment and, and the back of house. And, you know, you know how to read a, a brief, you know how to dig into what, what's needed. Those are the collaborations that work. Um, so the long-winded answer, I, I think there is a lot more movement now with small practices, their participation in, in larger scale projects and collaborating, collaborations with large practices. That, and it's never been like this. And it's, it's truly exciting. On the other side, I think there are a lot of large practices now who are getting a little bit used to working with smaller firms. Because they're more agile, they're a tap they can turn on. A small firm is a tap you can turn on and off for a large firm. Um, a large firm, you know, they can't disassemble a team of 11 architects or 15 architects quickly and have those dissolve into the structure of the office. There's overhead, there's a much 
you know, much more concrete. We as small firms, we're agile. We've got knowledge base, we've got experience. And we're able to kind of uh, bring a, 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 an input of, of I think, excitement and, and thinking to the problem solving and the team structure that many larger offices are a little bit reluctant to do. So again, long-winded answer, I prefer the relationship as a smaller office. Um, I hope that answers the question. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, I can see Gillian's, uh, Gillian Scampson's asked a question which I had written down myself as well. And that is, can you talk us through an example of a successful recent collaboration? What were the highs and lows? Uh, personally, we had a very, very successful um, uh, collaboration with uh, Grimshaw. Um, and, and yes, we were working on aviation, uh, third runway, Heathrow expansion project. Personally, for, for an office, um, we were brought in uh, in an ideal situation where the, uh, a bit of context. I worked on Terminal 5 many, many years ago for, for Rogers and had, had an interesting process of it and, and enjoyed it. When we did Terminal 5, it was all under the Egan, Egan ethos of uh, collaborative working uh, frameworks. So all the practices, the 16 top tier suppliers, everything from Rogers to YRM, Chapman Taylor, HOK, uh, uh, O'Rourke before he was lying O'Rourke, um, steel suppliers, they signed to a framework agreement saying, we'll do this for cost. We have agreed to fees. There is no tendering. There was no tendering for the steel work. There was no tendering for, so it was this great environment. But at the time Heathrow said, we're going to manage all of you guys. You know, this collaborative working is great, but we're going to manage. So they had, they had up team managers. Fast forward to the Heathrow expansion, it was completely different. Heathrow basically said these large scale projects, there's one person who's got 360 vision on these projects and it's the architect. They went through a very, very um, interesting selection process to choose their architect. And, and they, they chose Grimshaw. And they said to Grimshaw, you're going to manage everyone. You're going to do the drawings. You're going to manage. You're going to manage all the consultants. And everyone's going to come to you. And you are the hub. So we were brought in in, a, in that environment. Heathrow then reached out to us and said, listen, you know, I, I know what you did years ago on, on Terminal 5. Would you consider with your firm coming in and integrating into the Grimshaw? Grimshaw were, were um, really pleased to get direct input. They were a beauty to work with because they understood the importance of managing. They had the right people to manage. They understood the need to communicate throughout all the different consultants, but they understood the power of experience and to be able to you know, rifle through the brief and say, the spaces actually don't need to relate in, in the way you're, you're brief. They can work in this way. And they and when you explain it through diagrams, drawings, perspectives, and you explain it to the client, and the client says, This is what I was looking for, this integrated design team where everyone is working on the same problem. So personally, our experience has worked quite well uh, in that form. In the States, we, we did a collaboration with a, a local practice in, in Washington, DC, which worked equally as well in that there was no, there was a clear division. The, the firm in the US were, were sort of the client managers. They knew the whole planning process and they would essentially uh, be responsible for the project. And we were brought in to, to be concept. So every drawing that was presented, every diagram was ours. Personally, I, with collaborations, there is always that risk where you're presenting and it's you know, this mad rush to present everyone's working day and night get into the room put on the presentations and the large firm and the small firm are saying contrary things and you've got these drawings that don't line up and i don't mean physically but the, the ideas are wrong it's just and the client says guys you're not speaking to each other what the hell is going on so 
there are successful ways and, and there are catastrophic results as well. So I realize I'm muted. Thank you for that excellent answer, Dennis. Um, I was going to ask, you mentioned diagrams and your, your presentation was wonderfully uh, rich with diagrams as well. But I'm always curious as to the, what comes before those diagrams. So maybe you could run us through maybe some conversation you're having to maybe that establishes not hierarchy, but um, those relationships that produce those diagrams. Between firms, I, I, it, you know, you get contacted um, mm. or you're looking to contact a small firm and you get them, it used to be you get them in the room and you start talking. And it's, it's that initial conversation. I mean, the importance of, of, of how someone says, someone defines the problem to be solved is critical. And you could tell, you know, if you're contacted by a partner from a large project who, who is, you know, a commercial partner, they don't know anything about the project, won't know who will be designing it. And you can tell immediately, you know, as soon as you start asking questions and they're very put off and they're like, well, you know, we'll get to that. You know, let's talk about scope division. Let's talk about fee. We say, well, hold on. I, 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 we need to know. We need to know how we're going to, it's a jigsaw puzzle. You know, how do we fit within that jigsaw? Mm -hmm. So those diagrams, that conversation, when it works well between two different size practices, it's because they are sharing those individuals in the room, might be two, might be six, it doesn't really matter, are sharing this kind of, you know, that moment where you close your eyes and you, you begin to imagine the project. So it's that that moment of, okay, it, it you know, the, the site borders a, a lake and, 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 you know, so what does that mean? And, you know, what, what's our position towards the lake? Well, there's a rail, railroad line between us and the lake and it all begins to unfold. And it, 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 it truly is um, the beginning of, of, of a doodle, which becomes the diagram, which becomes yeah. the organogram. So, it is that invisible process of design that um, that you know is starts with what you you guys are doing at the LSA. It's you know it's it's how do you bring those students to to a portion of London and start saying here are the problems. You know, you know what do we think? You know, the the studio leader will have an idea, but it's how do the, do the students come up and meet the challenge? Yeah, you know, it's it's. I guess. It's, Touching on that, I mean, I think there might be quite a few members of smaller practices within this uh, audience. I was wondering if you had any advice for for them on kind of positioning themselves, positioning themselves as being open for the kind of collaboration that you've talked about. What are the kind of cle the clear kind of signposts that large practices will be looking for when they're looking to partner with someone that they'd be like, okay, right, that's you mentioned kind of picking the ability to pick apart a brief. But that's quite it's quite a hard thing to really articulate on one's website unless you know their work intimately in the process that came about with a project. Yeah, um, it, it's a really difficult question. It's a, it's a it's a fantastic question because you know there is that horrific catch twenty two. As a small firm, you live. You know, you know, we'd like to engage you, but you haven't done this three times. <laughs> we haven't done it three times. We haven't had three opportunity. You know, so. I think it's everything from, um, you know, how can you, ex uh, how could you convey to a potential collaborating partner um, your deliverables on another project? And, you know, maybe not much has been built, but you've been drawing, you've been responding, you've been doing competitions, you've been doing feasibility reports. Um, there, you've got so much as a small office. Um, at your fingertips that, that you don't always think of. And it is photography. It's, you know, it's model making. It's that process of putting together ideas that ultimately respond to a building group. And you're right, it, it, you know, it, it is difficult to, to communicate how you deciphered a brief. Um, but by being able with a small firm to, to show what it is that you're you're interested as interested in as architects, and it might be incredibly theoretical work, and but that is a resource that you have to discuss 
with a practice and say, these are all thoughts on, on the, you know, the current housing situation. It's in complete disarray. What we're doing, what everyone is doing really isn't resolving the problem. Providing units, yes, but you know, fast forward 25 years and now, what are people going to be thinking about how we did that? These are our thoughts. This is what we've been doing. Here's a report. Mm-hmm. Or here's an animation that we've been working on. We, you know, we think it, it communicates something. Um, you've, you've got material. Maybe material is the wrong word. But you've, you've got the ability to communicate what it is that drives you. What it is that you know, made you go out and say, we're going to open our, our own office. Um, it, it is an incredibly uphill battle. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of doors to knock on. Um, large offices now, you know, it's no secret. Uh, uh, corporate clients, the GLA have a great structure of, uh, of, of, of wanting to see emerging small offices get involved. Um, the frameworks are, are are refreshingly open to hearing. Okay, we know you haven't done, and, and, and the frameworks are really, really cheeky. You know, you go on to you make an application to a framework and is affordable housing. Great, show us three case studies. Well, we haven't done them, but show those three concepts that you've done, and where it says client budget date, you know, uh, year constructed. And you write a paragraph and you say, it hasn't been built. We have no client. We've done it on ourselves. This is what we think. And I think we will be quite surprised. We have been quite surprised that there were some frameworks who really took the time to read those documents, who then said, well, we'd like to understand further. And so you get, you know, the door is slightly open. So you put your foot in as hard as you can and you, you, begin the next level of discussion with them. But it is true that the small office, although although there's a greater platform than ever before, there is still that incredibly upward uphill battle. Would would you recommend kind of small practice being involved in any particular networks other than the LSAs, of course? (laughs) (laughs) There are a host of of networks. uh, networks are great and they're important. The NLA, Architectural Foundation, Open City, uh, they're fantastic and they're really important. Um, curiously enough, there are a lot of large practices who are funding a lot of that. <laughs> and yeah. the platforms often get kind of pulled over their way, but um, they're open platforms. The NLA is a fantastic platform. Um, to promote ideas and, and, and conversation, mm-hmm. uh, architectural foundation. But I, what I really think is um, small practices doing self-initiated studies together, uh, self-publishing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and, and if we get, we know how to get information out today quicker than we ever have. You know, simply you know, doing a series of self-initiated you know, what if projects, especially in a period of pandemic and, and political uh, political uh, unknown, wh- where the hell things are going, um, and economic and Brexit, you know, there is a platform for our architects to step up further. And it doesn't have to be an application for an award, or it doesn't have to be to respond to uh, the 2021 prize for this. It could just be a, self-initiated studies saying, this is what we think. What you then do with that information it is sort of endless. And if we can get it in front of a few corresponding charities and, 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 and housing associations and, and, and councils and council leaders, mm-hmm. they start saying, look, cranky, look at this document. You know, let's use this. Let's go with it. Let's understand where this can bring us. That's a really interesting point. I can see we're at we've got three minutes officially left, and I'm going to sneak in one more question. And I guess so with, the, the, with these things, with this kind of question, it's hard to kind of identify or at least at least name um, a particular case. However, um, do you have any kind of uh, tips for identifying potential conflicts when collaborating with a large or smaller practice? You know, conflict does arise. You mentioned it in the presentation, but what other kind of 
uh, again, the signposts that are saying like, cool, this, this could be trouble in the horizon or potential conflicts in the horizon and then mitigating it. I think, uh, again, it, it really stems from what is it that they're, they are asking you to do? One, two is who has, who has the, the, dare I say, closer relationship with the client? There are collaborations where the, the client is incredibly um, willing to communicate with, with a smaller firm because they, they can get things out a little bit quicker. Yeah. And it does tee off the larger firm. So well, hold on, hold on. And to some extent, rightfully so. When you collaborate, you know, the client makes an additional demand, a demand, you, you need to speak together. If one is, is, is sort of responding a little bit quicker, a little bit more agile, you've got to be careful with that. Um, and then I, I think it, it, it really is um, making sure that you, you have the platform, making sure that if you've been brought in for you know, strictly execution, fine. If you've been brought in because, you know, we really like your design ideas on the following, then, then damn it, you, you know, you have the right to present your own ideas. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna wrap things up there at one minute to two, uh, which is good. Um, thank you all of you for, for coming and thank you particularly to, for Dennis for that illuminating presentation and answering questions after as well.